Welcome to this lecture where we will be discussing the signs and symptoms of pneumonia, as well as the investigations that will help in the diagnosis and management of these patients. If you haven't already done so, be sure to check out our other video on pneumonia where we discuss the pathophysiology and causative agents. Firstly, let's look at some of the signs and symptoms that typically develop with patients who have pneumonia. Signs and symptoms are what the patient may complain of or what you may observe during your consultation. Patients may present with a fever, which is due to cytokine release from macrophages and other immune cells. These cytokines increase the thermal set point of the hypothalamus, which will cause the body to raise its temperature. In an attempt to meet this new set point, patients will often wrap up and complain of feeling cold. Patients may also have rigors, which is shivering in the presence of a high temperature in an attempt to generate more heat. A fever serves as a useful defence mechanism as the immune system works more efficiently at higher temperatures and it also provides an inhospitable environment for the pathogen. So trying to reduce temperature is not always in the patient's best interest. Patients may present with an increased respiratory rate, otherwise known as tachypnea. The area of consolidation is not participating in the gaseous exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide, which means the rest of the pulmonary system is going to have to work harder. Contrary to popular belief, it is actually carbon dioxide levels which have a greater effect on respiratory drive than oxygen. As gaseous exchange within the alveoli is impaired, it can cause hypercapnia, which means high CO2 levels. High CO2 levels then trigger chemoreceptors within the brainstem and increase respiratory drive by stimulating the respiratory center. The chemoreceptors that sense a change in carbon dioxide levels not only trigger the respiratory center, but they also trigger the cardiac accelerator center, leading to an increased heart rate. Heart rate will also be increased by fever, which increases the metabolic demands of the body, so the heart will pump more blood to try and adequately perfuse tissues and organs and remove waste products such as carbon dioxide. The reduced pulmonary function may cause patients to have a difficulty in breathing known as dyspnea and a shortness of breath which may be accompanied by a productive cough typically with sputum that may be yellow, green or even rusty in appearance. This is due to dead cells being removed from the pulmonary system and coughed up in mucus through that mucociliary escalator that we talked about. Patients may have a pleuritic chest pain caused by consolidation and the inflammation of the visceral and parietal pleura which covers the lung. As the patient breathes these layers can rub which can then worsen a patient's dyspnea. More sinister signs and symptoms that may indicate a deteriorating patient include cyanosis which is a blue discoloration which can be seen centrally, such as the lips or the tongue, or peripherally, such as the fingers. This is caused by a lack of oxygen bound to red blood cells. Patients may present with confusion, which may be due to the high temperature, hypoxia, dehydration, bacteremia, or poor perfusion caused by systemic vasodilation causing hypertension. This may also lead to a reduced urine output as the body tries to compensate for the hypotension and retain more water, or if the kidneys are not adequately being perfused. Also, a severe tachypnea, so a significantly elevated respiratory rate, a significant tachycardia, or very low oxygen saturations, would be quite an alarming sign in these patients. Now we know what kind of signs and symptoms these patients will present with, we can move on to the physical examination, which is especially important in the pre-hospital environment, as this is where we're going to be assessing the severity of a patient's illness and establishing the correct care pathway. Starting with an inspection, you may notice an increased respiratory rate, cyanosis, Use of accessory muscles to assist with breathing, such as the sternocloid mastoid muscle and the abdominal muscles. 
and you may also notice substernal and supraclavicular recession. When palpating the thoracic cavity, you may notice that there is an unequal expansion of the chest wall as the patient breathes in and out. This is because the area of consolidation has reduced ventilation and therefore will not fill with air and expand. Another assessment method that can be utilised during palpation is tactile fremitus. This is an assessment of lung tissue density and requires the clinician to place the hypothena aspects of the palm in various positions on the thoracic cavity whilst getting the patient to repeat a phrase out loud. This examination is conducted by comparing the vibrations across the thoracic cavity. Over areas of consolidation, there may be increased vibrations, and this is because sound travels faster through consolidation than it does air, thus increasing sound-induced vibration. Percussion allows us to assess lung tissue density, but it can have its limitations as the noise generated by percussion won't always penetrate into the deeper lung tissue. This test is performed by comparing the resonance throughout the thoracic cavity. Areas of consolidation may produce a dullness on percussion, otherwise known as being hyporesonant. Vesicular sounds are normal breath sounds heard throughout lung tissue. Over the trachea and main bronchi, you may hear loud, harsh, turbulent sounds, which are perfectly normal, but should not be heard throughout lung tissue. If these loud, harsh sounds, known as bronchial breath sounds, can be heard, then this may be a sign of consolidation. You may be able to hear these bronchial breath sounds over areas of consolidation because, as already discussed, sound travels faster through consolidation than it does air. Adventitious sounds may also be heard, which are sounds on top of normal breath sounds. These may include crackles or crepitations heard over the areas of consolidation. During the auscultation aspect of the physical examination, we can also utilise bronchophony and egophony. Bronchophony is when the patient says a phrase such as 99. In normal lung tissue, air should muffle the sounds, whereas over consolidated tissue, the sound will be heard more clearly. Egophony is very similar and involves the patient saying the letter E. The sound should be muffled by healthy lung tissue but over areas of consolidation, it will be heard clearly. A lot of these findings are what are known as focal, so they are specific to an area of the lung tissue. This helps in aiding the diagnosis, as other chest infections, such as bronchitis, are more diffuse and won't have these focal findings. After we've conducted the physical examination, these patients may need further investigations, but this isn't always necessary especially if the patient can be managed safely in the community. A tool that can be used to help predict mortality is the CURB 65 score or the CRB 65 score if operating in the pre-hospital environment. Each parameter scores a 1 if present. This includes a new onset of confusion, urea greater than 7, a respiratory rate greater or equal to 30, or a systolic less than 90 or a diastolic less than 60 and if the patient is aged over 65.
If the patient scores a 1, there is a predicted under 5% mortality rate. A 3 is 15% mortality rate. And 5, there is an over 25% mortality rate in these patients. It is recommended though that a score of 1 or more in the pre-hospital environment is conveyed to hospital. To aid in the diagnosis and management, further investigations can be conducted, which include a chest x-ray, which will vary in its findings depending on the severity and the type of pneumonia, such as bronchial or lobar. Lobar pneumonia will typically have this consolidation isolating to a particular lobe, whereas bronchopneumonia will show up more diffuse and patchy with a reticular pattern. A full blood count will usually show an elevated white blood cell count. However, it may be normal in those who are immunocompromised or who have an overwhelming infection. C-reactive protein is an acute phase response protein which is released in the presence of microbial infections or cell necrosis. This will be raised in response to infection and will be significantly raised in the presence of a bacterial infection. So this may help guide management. Viral infections will cause a much more moderate rise in C-reactive protein. If the CRP is less than 40, you may need to reconsider the diagnosis. A full blood count may also show neutrophilia, which is a high neutrophil count. This is also indicative of a bacterial infection. An increase in the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, or ESR, may also be present. However, this is a non-specific sign of inflammation and may be raised due to other factors such as comorbidities. Hemoglobin may be low and it is important to investigate whether the patient is suffering from hemolytic anemia. This is highly suggestive of mycoplasma pneumoniae as the causative agent. An arterial blood gas may show low partial pressures of oxygen, high partial pressures of carbon dioxide, and the pH level may have dropped, indicating respiratory acidosis. In response to this, bicarbonate levels may also be raised, displaying a metabolic compensation. Lactate is raised when cells go into anaerobic metabolism, and a lactate greater than 2 could indicate sepsis. Sputum cytology can help to identify what type of pathogen is causing the infection by gram stain, colour, odour and cultures. This is only really done in severe cases, and it's important to note that cytology might not be able to identify the exact bacteria, but whether it is gram-negative or positive. Finally, we can measure urea and creatinine, which may be elevated if the patient is dehydrated or if the patient is going into an acute kidney injury as a result of the infection. Now that we've looked at the signs and symptoms, the physical examination, and other investigations that can be conducted, let's talk about the management of these patients. The early recognition and management of pneumonia is important to stop the illness from progressing and to ensure that patients are put on the best care pathway. Pre-hospital management should focus on a comprehensive history taken physical examination to aid in the diagnosis and help assist in the patient care plan. A thorough examination will determine as to whether the patient needs to be admitted to hospital or whether they can be managed in the community. The primary focus should be on correcting any life-threatening complications which includes ensuring adequate ventilation. Initial management may include oxygen therapy to treat hypoxia and fluids to treat dehydration or hypotension. It is also important to consider pain relief, especially if this is worsening the patient's level of dyspnea. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories will suffice and paracetamol can also be provided. For more severe pain, opioids can be used, but this may cause respiratory depression and worsen a patient's symptoms. In mild cases of pneumonia, empirical treatment can be utilised to cover the most common causative agents without placing the patient through any further investigations. Penicillins are most commonly utilised, such as amoxicillin, as this will target gram-positive bacteria. 
the most common causative agent, Streptococcus pneumoniae, is a gram-positive bacteria. Alternatively, a macrolide such as clarithromycin may be prescribed which targets both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, such as Haemophilus influenza. In more severe cases, patients can be given a dual course which includes a penicillin and a macrolide. There are other antibiotics available, depending on the suspected causative agent and other contributing factors such as comorbidities. Other antibiotics that may be used are cephalosporins and tetracyclines. When managing a patient in the community, it is important to take into consideration social factors, such as whether the patient has anyone who can help them, whether they can manage with daily living activities, whether they will remain compliant with the treatment plan, and whether they are capable of calling for help if they were to deteriorate. Thank you for watching, and I hope you found this video helpful. Be sure to check out our other videos, and if there are any topics you would like us to cover, then please leave a comment in the comment section below.